For now, I'll have to let the above outline of Ronsay's interest in the aesthetics suffice. He announces, contrary to his enemies in aesthetics, an era in which it is possible at last for everything to be represented in art. And that era of unlimited artistic representation corresponds precisely to an era in which emancipation is universally possible and should begin at last to proceed. So a couple of concluding thoughts. I want to finish up by pointing out what Rancier is and is not doing in his work. Undoubtedly, Slavoj Žižek is right when he says that, quote, in our time of the disorientation of the left, Rancier's writings offer one of the few consistent conceptualizations of how we are to continue to resist. For all that, however, I think Alain Badiou may well be right to suggest that, quote, Rancier tends to identify politics in the realm of its absence and from the effects of its absence. That is, that Ronce contents himself merely with having managed to avoid being, like so many others, a renegade rallying to consensus, a thermodurian. I'm not sure how fair this criticism is in the end, especially coming from Badiou, who strictly calls into question the distinction between action and thought. But if it is right, then I likely fall into the Ronciarian camp. More theorist than activist, but consistently engaged in the undeniably crucial work of theory, I hope Ronce and I fall on the correct side of the political lines we are intent on helping to draw. addressing that, that directly. Um, though there are a couple of his works on aesthetics I haven't read yet. Um, but, uh, I mean, that's kind of the approach of Jean Baudrillard, right? Is to, to take the, the independence of art as being intertwined with the rise of capitalism. But I, th I think Rancier is offering a really interesting, so I don't know that I'm answering the, the criticisms directly, right? But I think that Rancier is offering a, a, a pretty powerful alternative to that vision of things. And, and in large part, what he's trying to do is, uh, is to address the, the problematic just of what's happened in the 20th century with the fusion of, of Marxist art and, and Marxist critical theory, the Frankfurt School in particular, and then especially thinkers like Leotard in the last couple of decades. Um, but but I, I think he's offered a pretty powerful model for making sense of, of the, the idea in the, in the aesthetic regime of this blurring of the distinction between art and non-art. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, does that does that? Could I do a brief? Yeah. But but I mean, doesn't capitalism itself always blur the distinction between the productive and the non-productive in an, an analogous fashion? Yeah, but strictly analogous. I mean, I mean, 
But, I mean, our, no, no, meaning we're, we're dealing with the, an era in which you can put up a paint can, right, and call it up. So, so that not just art and non-art, but that non-art becomes art. So I'm not sure I'm following the distinction you're drawing. Well, I mean, the, the distinction, for example, would be Facebook. Okay. Right? Facebook is inherently, right, a non-productive aspect, or, or if we want to get into memory, it's just intellectual production. And most of us on Facebook generate no capital. Right? What we're doing is not labor in any traditional Marxian sense, yeah. but yet, nevertheless, surplus value, that is to say profit, is extracted from the very non-labor actions that we take. Okay. And our entire culture is being fused right, with these sort of microtransactions or uh, the generation of wealth completely outside of any you know, immediate human labor. Right? So it seems like analogously that one can hold up right, a paint can and call it art, Capital has now, through its mechanisms, may be able has come to the position where it can extract wealth from non-labor, right, and hold that up as a, a model of extraction. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's a completely different register from Ronsi's argument. That's, I think that's why I'm struggling to figure out exactly how to address it. But uh, yeah, and more than anything, he's trying to respond to this. this and, and in particular, it's this ethical turn that aesthetics has taken, with, with Leotard in particular, right? where we're talking about the unrepresentable films of the Shoah and this kind of thing. That it's, it's a film that only tries to demonstrate the unrepresentability of, of the evil that takes place in the camps or something like this. And, and he's trying to say that everything has become completely representable. And long before the rise of explicitly communistic art, right? that something's happening in this link between these two inventions at the same time. Um, yeah, so sloppy answer to good questions that I want to see how Rancia handles this. <laughs> For now. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so if all people can speak, how would there be order in the society? Why ball? <laughs> um, no, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what your question aims at, right? Uh, well, so, so for example, you're saying that if, if, if people have a voice, everybody has a voice. Usually what I notice is when everybody agrees to have a voice, all that happens is you get chaos that emerges. There is no order. Speech, not voice, right? Voice is mere animal sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Everybody can yeah. speak. They actually have their, they believe they have, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of speaking very much like an organizational thinker here, but you know, people generally, this is sort of what happened in a lot of revolutions, is that everybody believed they had a voice, but in the end, nobody did have a voice. It just became, a few people that had speech and they were, were governing masses because everybody sought for some sort of order. Yeah. From the disorder that was created. So if everybody can speak, how is it that you can create order? An order of a society where everybody still has speech. Are you gonna are you did you want to respond to that question? I don't want to respond directly, but I have a slide comment that's similarly related. Just take an hour. Yeah, minutes. throw it now. Well, Lacan has a very precise notion of what speech is, right? When you when you speak, you it presupposes two things. One that there's a person speaking, and then a person that's being spoken to. Yeah. So I guess in this conception of speech, vis-a-vis -vis Rancière, uh, who is doing the speaking and who are they speaking to, in a sense? Yeah, well, I mean, for, and for Rancière, it's a question of the name more than than the speaking, right? It's it's assigning yourself the name as a speaking being. It's not that everyone has to speak all the time. And so for, for him, it's it's the naming of something that's passing in the situation without being discernible. Uh, and I didn't mention this in the course of this, right? But Rancé says, says they, the name that needs to be named is worker. That, especially in Europe, the, the word worker simply disappeared. Uh, uh, and so this, this name needs to be named so that workers, especially uh, illegal immigrants and this kind of thing, I, I, emerge and, and have a genuine political status. Um, so it's less a question of everyone getting a voice to speak, which I think you would say ends up being parapolitics. Yeah. And then how does he, like, so the conception of Sanju just being like, I the truth speak. Yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't read enough Sanju, sorry. 